Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Ora Bora. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Tomo, founder of Nashi. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what does your company do? We make organic kids' food. It was conceived out of my frustrations at having two children who weren't interested in mealtimes. I didn't have trouble feeding them broccoli or vegetables. They love vegetables. Oh, wow. They just weren't interested in mealtimes. And I wanted to try and make mealtimes more exciting for them. And here we are eight years later. That's pretty amazing. And obviously, you were on Shark Tank. We'll get to that a little bit later. But before we do that, what was like your first step in creating this concept? What were you trying to solve? And obviously, for people who don't know the product, it's, it's kind of unique. It's, it's a, an immersive thing. You can play with it. And so give people a window into what the product is and then the problem you were trying to solve. Well, the product we've been selling for the past few years is called Food Paint, which is a set of tubes of different colored organic fruit puree. So you got to have three tubes in a set, strawberry, peach, blueberry, or the Crayola set is raspberry, mango, and grape. And we also launched ketchup last year in the same size tubes in the same format. I had become a stay-at-home dad. I worked in the fashion industry for 20 years, became a stay-at-home dad when our second child was born, and this mealtime thing became obvious quite quickly. So I spent a lot of my free time wandering the aisles of grocery stores in downtown Manhattan looking for this product, which I was convinced must exist, but actually didn't, which was a product that you can give to kids to use themselves, something that they t- can you give them the responsibility give them some autonomy, give, you know, you know, show them that you trust them, try and bring them into the process of creating a meal and, and, and give them something to, to look forward to, something that, you know, they can look forward to getting up to the table to do. And it didn't exist. And I found that rather strange. And still to this day, there are very few food products designed specifically to be used by children. There's a lot of products designed to be eaten by children, but not many that actually give and give the kids any responsibility or, or any sense of trust. So at the same time as this was going on, I had volunteered to do friendly visiting with the elderly and I'd been paired with a lovely old couple on the Upper West Side called Ben and Peggy. And we used to sit with each other every Friday morning for an hour or so and just discuss the world and our week. And I would talk about this ongoing project of mine this ongoing search and one evening Peggy emailed me and she said I've got a business proposition for you and I was due to see them the next morning and I went up there and she she ironically had seen an episode of Shark Tank wherein two women had successfully pitched a product to the sharks that was multicolored, neon colored cookie dough edible cookie dough and it was full of artificial colors and sugar and artificial flavors and Peggy had been very frustrated by that and she was trying to think of a a healthier version of that and combine that thinking with me saying why aren't there any products out there that kids can use at mealtimes? And that was the uh, bones of the idea that became food paint. And as soon as she said it to me, I was like, that's a really good idea. And almost ran home because like, in the space of my hour meeting with her, we thought of what the colours would be, what the flavours would be, you know, the fact that it would need to be in tubes. So all of that was all, <laughs> all sort of there. I mean, it was done. You know, that's amazing. Red is obviously strawberry. Blue is obviously blueberry, blah, 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 blah. Sure. And so I went home and sat down and I was like, I was completely inspired because um, I was looking for a new career. You know, I didn't want to go back into the fashion industry. It was fun then, but it wasn't fun then. And so I sat down and I opened Google and I was like, what does one type if one wants to start a food company? I had no idea. I was literally typing how to start a kid's food company, how to launch it. <laughs> and there's nothing there. I mean, to cut a long story short, it took me three months to speak to it. My first useful conversation happened three months later and, and, and it wasn't for lack of trying either. That's unbelievable. I really love that. And so, I mean, first of all, good story. I love how that happens so naturally and organically like your product. And then why the name? What does the name mean? I think because of my background in fashion, I, you know, I did a lot of, you know, a lot of the, you know, it was, it's a very creative industry. So that was my background. There was a lot of visuals and creativity. And mm-hmm. when, I was like, okay, this is quite an exciting project. I've got to, I've got to come up with a kid's food product and I can do whatever I want because it's a crazy product with a crazy idea behind it. Packaging, where do we start with packaging? Where do we start with names? And, and I started looking at Japanese food packaging and mm. I think Noshi came about through me looking at all of these images of this packaging and it wasn't a word that I, I remember thinking this should be called Noshi or looking for Noshi or somebody suggesting Noshi. I think it was just born of me looking at all this packaging. There must have been a word on one of them that was either Noshi or Toshi or Boshi or something like that. 
But that's where Noshi came from. And of course, because of the connection with Nosh and then the Yiddish, you know, element of that and, and Peggy latching onto that as well, Noshi mm. seemed like the best like the like the like the best name for it. And I still think it's a great name. You go home, you start working on this product. Are your kids your beta testers at the time? Are they the ones sort of experimenting with it, trying this out? And what was the hard part? What was the hard part of getting it right? I went home and, and bought a quiz in art and then or you know, went to the grocery store, bought a pound of strawberries, a pound of peaches, a pound of blueberries, a pound of, because there was we were gonna do savory flavours as well. So I bought a pound of carrots and a pound of peas came home, cooked the carrots, cooked the peas, blended them all and put them in little jars and put them next to each other. I got a picture of it very early on our Instagram account and they looked amazing. And I was like, wow, this is brilliant. This is such a good idea. This is going to be a smash. Um, But then, of course, that first conversation I had three months in was with a woman who was working for a packaging company. And I, I sort of connected with her because I was looking for a packaging supplier. And she, in conversations with her, she also let slip that she advised food startups and I was like, ah, I need your help. And so we worked together for a while and she enlightened me to the fact that I need a food scientist. And I was like, why do I need a food scientist? And she said, well, to make it food safe and to make it, you know, a product that can be mass produced and saleable. And I was like, oh, okay. And of course, I found a food scientist eventually. I found my Fred, my food scientist, like as with most of the connections that have driven this business forward over the last eight years, nearly all of them came via connections at my kids' school or in the local playground. And Fred came about through one of the moms in the schoolyard and he obviously immediately enlightened me to the fact that you need to pasteurise fruit and vegetables. And when you cook certain fruit and vegetables, those colours in those jars don't mm-hmm. stay those colours in those jars. So. He then went off and spent 18 months getting the product to be the best version of itself um, before we even started to think about production. And is color the most important part just from, I guess, your, I guess the child's perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's a real, I've I've always been fighting a slightly losing battle with the color because it's an organic product and it always had to be an organic product. And I feel very strongly that it should be an organic product, but it being organic, you can't add artificial colors. And so trying to sell a product that's, meant to be brightly colored and it sometimes not being as brightly colored as people want it to be or expect it to be i find that very frustrating i mean, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I take yeah. it personally that we can't make it you know that we can't make it the same colors as those neon colored cookie dough what the peggy was initially inspired by you know i'd like it to be neon yellow and neon pink and neon blue and neon red but we you just can't get it there and you know so that's had to be you know you have to make peace with that i think yeah, that makes sense. And so then what was your first step? Like, what was the first store you guys were in or how did you officially launch? I've done this all backwards and probably due to a complete okay. due to a complete lack of experience in the industry, like not knowing what a PO was until somebody asked me to send them a PO, not knowing what COGS was until somebody explained what COGS was. <laughs> um, and so, again, my wife has a friend who worked with Albertsons, he he helped that he he works at Goldman Sachs, and he works with Albertsons or worked with Albertsons, and he had a really good relationship with their national head of sales, a guy called um, Larry Hansen, who he put me in touch with, and Larry was lovely and always championed the product. He's now retired, lucky Larry, um, but he immediately loved the product and championed it and said, "I'm going to introduce you to all of my 31 regional sales managers." on an email, but you have to call them, call, you have to call each of them individually and convince them to stock this product. And I was like, Jesus Christ, that's absolutely terrifying. Okay. And so I did, uh, I sat down, you know, I had all the phone numbers and I sat down, I worked through them. And by the end of it, seven of them had agreed to carry the product. And I then had to speak to Kehi and get hooked into Kehi because I didn't know anything about distribution either. And, and Kehi has, staff that work inside Albertsons because Albertsons is such a big account and so Albertsons put me in touch with Kehi and then the Kehi onboarding process took about three months during which you know I was like okay this is happening now these stores are expecting this product by this date I don't have a co-packer which was something else I didn't I didn't know the existence I didn't know what co-packers were I didn't, <laughs> sure. didn't, didn't know what they were uh, was enlightened to their existence by Fred again and Then I started researching co-packers near New York and none of them had tube filling machines because nobody puts food in tubes in this country. They do in the UK and (laughs) Europe and Australia and pretty much everywhere else apart from the USA. So I had to 
buy a tube filling machine, a very old, decrepit tube filling machine with, I'm going to diplomatically say it has, has a large personality, as do most tube filling machines, because they have a million and one moving parts. And at any moment in time, between one and a million of those parts can decide to stop working. And so obviously to order to, to buy this very, very old, very, very cheap tube filling machine, I had to take on investment. So I did some friends and family. I, I took on some friends and family investment and bought this $22,000 machine, moved it into an organic incubator in New Jersey and would be going, I, I, I was still a stay at home parent at this time. My wife was going to work every day. I was taking the kids to school and immediately driving to New Jersey, drop the kids at school, drive to New Jersey, turn this machine on. And one mother in the playground, especially, I would come her, I would be back in the city by three o'clock to pick up the kids and she, <laughs> she would say, how many tubes did you fill today? And I'd say, one. Or, or how many tubes did you fill today? None. How many, and, and I was meant to be filling 9,000 tubes a day. And so I'd come, and so like this went on for days and like, like I think the biggest number I got up to was like 12. We filled 12 tubes today because the machine just didn't want to play ball. And like, meanwhile, I'm seeing this deadline rapidly approaching down the road towards me. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. And lo and behold, Christ, well, I do know how it happened because I was put in touch with the mo with a genius engineer called Donnie. And Donnie effectively moved into the incubator with me. And he just got the machine to run. And he and I still work together now, seven years later. Um, and he's a genius. And he got it to run. And we got the product out to these 175... Albertson stores and I think 74 Safeway stores just in time we got it out to them and within two weeks of that happening Jewel Osco big country huge grocery chain I'd never heard of it they came on board and said we want to put it in all of our stores so that was another I think that was another 200 stores maybe maybe it was 265 wow. total so within a month of us getting this machine working we were suddenly in <laughs> like 300 stores and I was like oh my god this is amazing Nobody had told me about marketing. Nobody, had <laughs> even though, even though I'd spent twenty years working in the fashion industry, literally creating advertising campaigns for brands like Calvin Klein and Louis, <laughs> Louis Vuitton, I hadn't really taken on board that I needed to create marketing for my company and that that would cost money. And so I didn't have that money because I've always just been a one man band. And so it was tough. Oh man, I, I don't think I've ever laughed so much on a podcast. This is quite tremendous and I, I really appreciate your sort of your candor or honesty around how you you really didn't know what you were doing and I think that's entrepreneurship in a nutshell and the goal of people listening to this podcast and, and sort of our whole platform is to inspire people being like oh you know I'm I'm just like Tama like I'm, I'm I have no idea but I have a vision of this thing that should exist in the world and now I'm going to go create it and I'll figure the rest out there there's a real beauty to that there's an honesty to that it's literally that cliche of the entrepreneur jumping off the cliff and building the plane on the way down but in my mind that I always pictured that as happening on a bright sunny day with no wind right in my <laughs> my journey that happened in the middle of the night during a raging storm with a blizzard it's raining it's snowing there's rocks flying through the air and I'm still trying to build an aeroplane on the way down. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a really good question. We could pose that to any entrepreneur. All right, so entrepreneurship is you're off the cliff, the plane. You're building the plane while, you're, while it's falling. What's the weather? It's a good question. Everybody would answer that differently. Is there a ground or is there an ocean? What's under How you? How far away is the ground? What's the weather? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there trees under you? Yeah, is what is the ground? Are you going to survive if you don't build the plane? Is the ground made of... Is are there cushions on the ground? <laughs> That's right. In my head, there's always an ocean, but I hadn't considered <laughs> the version of the weather. I think it was a, an ocean that, that you definitely don't survive landing in. <laughs> yeah, it's going to hurt no matter what. On this bright, sunny uh, day. So, so at some point you probably return to Peg and you go, "All right, it's my turn to go on Shark Tank." <laughs> Is that how did that happen? That again, crazy. So she put that idea in front of me in February two thousand and fifteen. By April two thousand and fifteen, I was like, "We need to do a Kickstarter because this is going to cost a lot of money." Um, so we put a Kickstarter online and looking to raise twenty thousand dollars. Ha ha. And it went live and two weeks later, halfway through the Kickstarter, and we were struggling to raise the money, um, but two weeks into the Kickstarter, I got an email from Shark Tank 
and they had seen it and they said, this is amazing. We want to put you on the show. We're really late in the application process. If you're interested, let us know immediately and we'll send you the paperwork. And I said, yes, please. That would be amazing. They sent me all the paperwork, filled it all in, sent it back. They then scheduled a call with all of their production crew and it was an hour long call on a Monday evening. They were all in LA. Peggy was on her phone at home. I was on mine at home. And at the end of this call, the producer said, look, I can't give you a definitive answer today because that's not how we do things, but I'm very confident in saying you're going to be on next season Shark Tank. And I was like, wow, that would be great. This was in spring of 2015. Meanwhile, the first food scientist I'd been put in touch with just went rogue. He just completely went completely off reservation. I sent him tubs, tubes of or of fruit puree, just 100% fruit puree and vegetable puree. And I said, make these food safe, make these store ready and he came back and he said no I don't think you should do this you should do you know let's use concentrated orange juice and we could do jellies and let's do a chocolate f-. and I was like no 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 just please do what I've asked you to do it's not complicated is it uh, and he and he couldn't get his head around it and he started sending me samples that had coconut oil in them and it was like it was a really hot summer in New York by this point like it's summertime wow. and he's sending me these samples in an unrefrigerated, you know, in an un- in a in a FedEx box that doesn't have cool packs in it. And I open them up and they're like little tubs of salad dressing that looks like oil and vinegar that's separated. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? What is that? Wow. And I'm yeah. literally ha- st- sitting here looking at these things going, oh my God, what the hell is that? And my phone rang and it had an LA area code. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I picked it up and it was Heather, the producer. She was amazing. And I and I, I just went, I'm really sorry we can't do this. I'm so sorry we can't do it. And she went, I'm so glad you said that. I was about to say the same thing to you. You're not ready yet. And I said, good. And um, I said, wow. but I said, wow. but have we blown it? I mean, is this ever going to, can we ever resurrect this? And she said, just let me know when you're in stores. When you start, when you start selling this stuff, email me and we'll get back to the conversation. Fast forward two years. And we get this stuff sent out, you know, the machine's working, we send the product out, it's about to hit the shelves in Albertsons, and I email her, and she's left her job. And so the whole thing just sort of went by the wayside. Okay. So that was annoying, and then it wasn't, and I was like, okay, well, it's, you know, I'm very pragmatic, I think you have to be when you're doing something like this, you have to just, like, roll with the punches. And so, fast forward to last spring, last April, sitting at home and I'm like the the and I'd always known this and I always I had always talked about this a lot at length with anybody who would listen which was the problem with food paint is that kids understand it immediately but their parents don't they don't understand what it is why they need to buy it whether their kids are going to play with it whether kids playing with food is a good thing or a bad thing are kids going to squirt it up the walls are they going to squirt it on their baby brother kids just you know kids respond to parents trusting them and so mm-hmm. if you say to a kid this is for you this box of stuff is for you to use they can't believe they're like they're like what really you you trust me to do this and you're like yeah i do and they respond to that and they just sit down and they draw their smiley face on their food but i didn't know how to get that message across to parents and i always knew that it was either going to require the aforementioned bud marketing budget which i've never sure. had or a national platform and so i was sitting there last April, April 22, and I was like, Shark Tank. The reason we didn't do it last summer is we weren't in stores. We're in Walmart now. Surely they're going to find that sexy. So I went back through all of my old emails, like Cherry picked all of the Shark Tank addresses out of my um, sent sent and received emails, went on LinkedIn. They obviously were new staff, it being five, six years later worked out what their email addresses would be. And I sent the same email to six different people all saying the same thing, had the same subject line. We were, you know, we were nearly on Shark Tank, now we're in Walmart. Da, 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 da. Um, and I just sent them all off. And I, I just did it to be proactive because it was a particularly tough time. My wife was living in England with her parents because she was very, very sick with long COVID and I wasn't able to look after her and the kids and run the company. And... I was like, my God, I've got to turn this around. I've got to, you know, I've got to, my wife may never work again. You know, I've got to, I've got to do something. And so I was just, it was a, you know, it was a day where I was like, trying to keep everything together. I've got to be proactive. And so I'm just going to send these emails and I've sent them now and it's, you know, I've done it. And at least I've done it. And at least I've tried. Didn't expect anybody to reply to it. And I think it took 22 minutes for one of them to reply. And then the next thing I knew, I was on the phone to them the next day and every phone call would end with, 
whoever I was talking to saying, okay, brilliant. I'm going to push this up to the next level. It'll probably take them two or three weeks to come back to you. Just sit tight. And then I would get a, an email two days later. So every time I was told it was going to take two weeks or three weeks and it would, they would come back to me within days. And so between April and early June, I, I had a series of interviews with increasingly more and more senior people. And then I was assigned two producers at the beginning of June last year. And then I did an hour long Zoom call with those two amazing producers every week uh, between June and me filming my episode wow. on September the 11th last year. Wow. Was Mindy one of those people that you were Zooming with? No, uh, Maggie and Kelly. Mindy's the casting director, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had Mindy on the pod too. And so before you, you get on, what do you, like, what is, are you thinking your dream scenario? You know, are you targeting a certain shark? Do you think, okay, this is the shark that can transform the company based on the background? What, what are you, what's the analysis going through your head of like how to execute? Well, first off, I don't want Shark Tank because I find it, absolutely terrifying <laughs> on, i'm just so so scared on behalf of the contestants i just find it too stressful so i had never watched it i had never never watched it i had to watch episodes last summer obviously to prepare myself and to train myself but i watched the bare minimum and of course they do also say don't watch the show obsessively because you'll you know mm -hmm. you don't want you do want to come into it fairly free form but i had very very little experience i know who the, i knew who the sharks were i know who the sharks are but beyond that, I didn't really have any experience of, of the show. But because there was so much at stake, I was standing backstage and, and the floor manager's here, the cameraman's here that's going to walk backwards down the tunnel with me walking towards him onto the stage. And I was more calm than I'd ever been in my life because I was like, this is like Eminem in, in 8 Mile. I have got one shot mm. and I'm not going to fuck it up. And so, so I walked out and I was, I was cold as ice and I knew I had the pitch. I knew I could do the pitch with my eyes closed back to front in a storm, falling off a cliff, word perfect. The only thing that did go wrong slightly is that just as I was, just as they were about to say action and he was about to walk backwards and I was going to walk, follow him down onto the stage, I suddenly realised I was desperate for a pee. And I was like, what, what am I going to do? There's oh, literally hundreds of people about to, they're all standing there waiting for me and I need to pee. I've got to pee. I've got to pee. I can't go out there and then be more and more desperate for a pee while I'm talking to the sharks. So I said, I'm pretty sorry. I need to pee. And they're like, okay, cut, everyone, five minutes. Hold on, hold on. And I went, had a pee. <laughs> Came back. There was somebody in the bathroom, so I had to wait for them to come out before I could have a pee. And this is in the studio in Sony. It was like, the, there were 200 people in there and they were all there for me and I was having a pee. <laughs> And so I came back, walked out onto the stage and they, you know, they do the, the establishing shot. So they make you stand still for a couple of minutes. And so I stood still yeah. for a couple of minutes. And then just towards the end of that two minutes, something, it was a technical fault. So they're like, okay, everyone stand down. And I had to stand there for another, <laughs> I had to stand there for another five minutes before they find, but again, I was like, I'm just here for one reason. I'm not scared. I'm not nervous. Yeah. I'm just going to do it. So I just stood there. They said action, I did the pitch, the questions came thick and fast as they do. I really didn't think it was going to be Mark because he speaks mm -hmm. so little in the episodes. Mm -hmm. yeah, he, he does fewer deals than most of the other sharks, but the others all dropped out in quite quick succession. <clears throat> yeah, that, that surprised me because when I was watching it, I thought they're all parents. I think all of them could help you out, in my opinion. It just seemed like they all have a platform that there's an angle here. And it was surprising to me. There was two things that were surprising. One, they all got it. They got it right away. It seems like they didn't like the margin. Okay, you can fix that, though. And I didn't understand why they were so quick to be out. It really surprised me, to be honest, because I'm like, all of them should be in on this. This seems like a no-brainer. It surprised me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I went in there not knowing. Yeah, because, of course, you know, you, I, I'm, I'm way too close to the product. Overthink it. Overthink everything, you know. You, as an entrepreneur, you always have periods of self doubt. Am I doing? Am I crazy? Am I doing good, the right thing or the wrong thing? So I really didn't know how they were going to take it. The only thing I do remember thinking is that after Damon went out, because they went round in a circle, it was um, Barbara, then Kevin, then Laurie, then Damon. And I was like, <laughs> when he started to explain his feelings, and I was like, he's going to say no. Fuck. 
what am I going to do? My life flashed before me. I was like, oh my God, because I, I really didn't think Mark was going to do what he did. And I was like, what are we going to do as a family? We are fucked. We are in yeah. deep, deep shit now. What on earth am I going to do? And then everybody looked at Mark. And yeah. you know that that pause, it felt like it lasted five years, but of course it was two seconds. <laughs> and it sounded like Barbara was like, "What are you doing, Mark?" Like, no, he... they edited that. <laughs> they edited that. Okay. It was Kevin that was amazed. Barbara didn't say that. She said that at, at, at another. At, at, you know, uh, from my memory, it was Kevin that was initially surprised that Mark had done that. I would like to think that he invested as much in me as in the product. I cannot let this fail. I will not let this fail. I mean, we food paint, you know, is is an amazing product and I believe in it still, but it is going to need a much bigger budget than the budget I have to do it properly. And so what we're doing next is we're launching a range of savory condiments in much bigger tubes that are these are products that people already buy, but we're aiming them at children. It's still all about empowering children at the meal time at the table, but it's ketchup and mustard and ranch dressing and you know honey mustard barbecue similar to chick-fil-a sauce you know we're, we're launching those because these are products that people already buy that they already love that do have a higher margin so i took obviously took on board what mark said in the studio because he's he's a very very clever man and so i took on board him saying you should be selling single tubes your margins are terrible i took all of that on board and came up with this and it was just you know it, it's it's the, you know this is this is the size of the tube Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like a, for people, I guess, listening, it's a toothpaste size, I guess. Well, no, it's much bigger than a toothpaste. It's quite bigger. hard to... Shampoo? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. It looks like a sunblock size. Yeah. It's like a big yeah. tube of sunblock. It's 10 ounces. And so far, they've had an amazing response from stores. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that next year is going to be very interesting. How long did it take for when you when the show ended to, to, to finalize the deal? They came back to me the the week bef- between Christmas and New Year of this year no last year so I taped it on September the 11th they went off and did due diligence and then came back a couple of days before New Year or maybe it was a couple of days after New Year and we finalized the deal about a week after that but you know as soon as we'd finalized the deal before we'd signed anything they immediately gave me access to people on, on Mark's team who are okay. amazing. They are yeah. the loveliest, smartest, most brilliant people in the world. And I speak to them every day and they are, wow. they are the best. Mark is amazing. His team is amazing. I speak to Mark by email every two or three weeks. I speak to you know, people on his team literally you know, more than once a day. That's awesome. I'm on your website now, and uh, it looks like everything is sold out, and so that's uh, it seems like a good sign. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's definitely. I mean, you know, I'm I've got a budget, and it's 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 not huge, and so I have to focus right now on getting these things out into the wild because, you know, this is a business, and and it's all very well me having a creative background and coming up with a product which I like. I say I still believe in food paint a hundred percent, but. Mm-hmm. I've got a company to run. I've got a company to build. I need to increase profits year on year. You know, I need to increase margins year on year. And food paint as a standalone product is not going to help me do that. So I have to get these other things out into the wild, which I think will help me do that at a fairly seri- at a fairly decent you know rate of knots. I think you know, I do think that this is going to happen differently. And then I want to come back to food paint. It needs to be done properly. You know, I think if I've learned one thing yeah. is that, you know, that product needs to be a certain way. And I, on my own, with the budget I have, can't make that product the way it needs to be today. But I will be able to next year and the year after okay. and the year after. What I love about your story in some ways, like you talk about the marketing a lot, but it's also getting on a national platform to be able to sort of educate the world on what your product is. It's like the ultimate hack. And it, it worked, I would imagine. What happened after Shark Tank? Uh, grocery wise, retail wise, you know, I assume it's obviously a bump, but, but now it seems like the, you've educated the market or you've solved the problem. Solved the problem. Um, I do think that it is a niche product. You know, I thought that it could be, you know, an equivalent to maple syrup. I thought it could be a product that like every household would not weekly, but might buy every month. And I think that was optimistic of me. I think it is a product that people now do understand and appreciate it for what it is. And kids obviously love it. But it's never going to be a product that is bought 
in millions of units on a weekly basis. It just isn't. And so I've got to grow my company and I've got to increase yeah. my profits and I've got to launch and grow products that are going to help me do that faster than slower. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And are you raising more capital now or where, where, where is the business now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm mean, not a huge amount and don't need to raise a huge amount. But yeah, I'm, I'm certainly looking to raise between half a million and a million dollars at the moment. And these are going to launch the new products at the, you're saying this year, maybe next year? They will be um, released into the wild next spring based on conversations sure. I've been having. That's exciting. Any name for them? Can you give us a tease? They're just called, they were going to be called SketchUp and crayonnaise and mustard with a t on the end but one of the retailers we spoke to he said that's really cute he said but don't you think that you want to just make sure customers understand this product immediately and put it in their grocery and based <laughs> obviously based on my experience with food pan, i was like yes Absolutely. I want them to understand it immediately and put it in their grocery cart immediately. I don't want them to sit there going, what is this? Which is, right. you know, was the problem I've been dealing with for the previous five, six years. I want them to yeah. go, oh, it's ketchup slam in the grocery cart. It's so funny. Uh, when I, I had a fashion company once and we were making these bow ties and we named them after our friends, you know, and it was like, because cause who doesn't like the James Bond or whatever, like, but they were our friends and it was just fun. And then somebody somebody says to us, do you think anyone Googles your friend's name when they're trying to buy a bow tie? And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, you need to say blue and white polka dot bow tie. And that's the name. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it was early days of SEO, but we would... I think if you re if you were to Google dinosaur bow tie, we were number one anywhere in the world. It was, and, and so it was just where the naming should just be descriptive and people shouldn't have to do calculus or know me personally to be like, I want that tie because that's Diego's friend, you know, that is in business school with him. It's like, that's, uh, yeah, these things seem silly at the time. Yeah, you, like, want, oh, yeah you want you want to break sense. the mold. You want to be creative. You want to do something different. Right. You want to, you want this product to jump off the store in the gross, uh, jump off the shelf in the grocery store. But people don't have time to stop and think, oh, that's creative. They're, you know, moms especially, they're rushing around the grocery store doing the shopping before they've got to get home and do this and this and this and then get the kids from school. You've got to make life easy for shoppers. And, you know, we all, entrepreneurs all talk about, you know, pivoting and learning from past mistakes and, and working out what worked from there, taking the good bits and leaving the bad bits. And that's, you know, I'm just going through that evolution at the moment. I love it. Well, look, this has been one of the most entertaining podcasts I've ever done. So thank you for, for at least entertaining me and our listeners. Um, where can people find you? Where can they purchase the product? Uh, what stores? I know you're on Amazon online. Where Pepper else? Pig Food Paint is still on Amazon. Um, and that's, there. there's Crayola Food Paint in about 500 Walmart stores um, still. So that's sort of our only, our only distribution at the moment. Um, and then, as I say, um, the, the savory condiments should be hitting shelves probably from next March, I think, if, if, if what I'm being told actually happens. And I'm quietly confident that it is. I love it. I'm going to buy some uh, for my nephews who I think will, will love this product. So look at Tomo. Thank you for your time. This has been amazing. I appreciate it. Take it easy. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for the support and making it to the end of the episode. If you haven't already, please leave a review and share the episode with your friends. If you never want to miss a beat on all things entrepreneurship, make sure to follow us on socials for daily content. See you next Tuesday for another great episode.